Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Para el Marco es un gran placer tenerlo y aquí a Naim Mohayemet. El día siguiente, después de haber inaugurado esta magnífica exposición de territorios indefinidos, en la que la pieza de Naim tiene un lugar muy destacado. Yo creo que es, una, es, un, es un trabajo realmente... Um, extraordinario, un, un trabajo que nos sitúa a nosotros como, como espectadores en el centro de una narrativa que se convierte coral y en la que nosotros tenemos que reconstruir continuamente este, el, el lugar no solo de, de las imágenes que, que la memoria nos ha legado, sino también a um, nuestra actitud ante ellas. O sea, el, el hecho de que eh, estemos en el centro de las tres pantallas creo que nos, no, nos permite también tomar una actitud muy activa ante aquello que estamos viendo y creo que uh, tiene total, una total relación con precisamente lo que estamos uh, hablando en la exposición, de lo que habla esta pieza y de temas que el museo ha ido tratando una y otra vez. Si la pieza algo destila, uh, es uh, todas esas, esas decepciones, ¿no? esas, esas uh, expectativas creadas, ¿no? cómo como se formó esa, esa esperanza de, de que el progreso podía llegar, de que, de que un mundo se podía construir en, en, en base a nuevas alianzas eh, basadas en algo que fuera más allá de los poderes a los que el mundo se había predestinado desde incluso antes de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, um, para, ese, para ese tobogán que desliza sobre otras realidades. ¿no? Si quizá en, la, en, en Two Meetings and a Funeral lo que más está visible es como Bangladesh y, y como muchos países pasan desde una promesa del socialismo hacia una realidad del islamismo, quizá desde otras perspectivas también se ha visto de otra manera. Quizá en Latinoamérica se pasa desde, desde, una, desde una expectativa de progreso a una realidad de la brutalidad uh, de la violencia y después de, de la hegemonía neoliberal. ¿no? Y todo eso va construyendo diferentes fases de uh, unas realidades que además constituyen nuestra vida, porque además Naim y yo, que somos casi nacidos en el mismo año, nos llevamos meses de diferencia. Naim, además, es, es, es incluso mayor que su propio país. You're older than your country. Uh, y, que, y, que, y que han ido constituyendo la memoria sobre la que está construida nuestra realidad actual y esa memoria que es tan poliédrica y que creo que el, el, el trabajo de Naim eh, reproduce también. Así que en, estamos muy preparados para escucharte y con muchísimas ganas de continuar sabiendo más de, de cómo se construyó ese, ese momento y cómo lo miramos desde ahora. Gracias. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I believe we are going to have simultaneous translation Uh, while I'm speaking, so that will be interesting for me also, because it's a new experience. Um, so, Iwai had asked me uh, to talk a little bit about the context for the film, for the three-channel film that is um, now at Magba as of uh, yesterday, two meetings and a funeral. Uh, the film is also uh, playing in some other places with particular interest in this history, particularly it's playing in um, Ljubljana right now. Um, as part of a project on non-alignment, through which I discovered all uh, many Eastern European artists who are working on this topic. And we can have a discussion afterwards as to why so many are interested in this topic at this very time. Um, I believe, and many others perhaps think the same way, is it's precisely when the present doesn't offer a clear vision of what the future will be, that people are looking back to the last moment when there seemed the possibility of a future. Certainly that's... Um, my motivation. Um, but my motivation coming from Bangladesh maybe is different from that, somebody from Slovenia, somebody from India. Uh, and part of what's been happening over the last one year is I've found that our interests are not aligned. Sometimes they're actually quite opposite to each other. And that seems appropriate also for studying the non-aligned movement because it's also movement where it seems people's interests were not aligned, even though uh, they're supposed to be under uh, one roof. So I'll talk a little bit about a background story that actually doesn't quite make it into the film uh, to talk about what I felt was the promise um, of this project. Uh, so this is S. Rajaratnam. He was the foreign minister of Singapore. Um, Singapore is not usually a country people think of in the context of socialism, radical politics, or even third world. Certainly not underdeveloped uh, is not a word that comes up thinking of Singapore. But 1973 was perhaps a different reality. Um, and it marks a point when Singapore also went on a different journey. 
Um, so my work over the last 10 years has been specifically about the 1970s. I have made five films all looking at the 1970s and specifically looking at the radical left, variously understood as socialist, communist or Maoist within this uh, movement. So I've been asked more than once why I spent so much time with the decade of the 1970s. Um, a curator asked me recently and kindly, uh, do you feel you're stuck uh, in the 1970s? So I thought I should also explain why maybe I'm stuck in that period. So I believe looking at this particular period, the 10 years leading to 1979, doesn't just map onto my own biography, first 10 years of my life, but a particular political history that I find very revealing. My obsession and that of others working through this period is that the 1970s offers the last clear view of an actual promise of world socialism. That is, is decades are useful ways to think of time, and some would argue they are not. Conventionally, many historians are used to thinking of 1989 as a watershed period, as the beginning of the sudden end. That year, I was a first year college student, a fresh arrival to America from Bangladesh. This was my first professor. Our first year college on social democracy in Western Europe was taught by the British Marxist Chris Howell. What I remembered is he was the first male professor I ever met who wore a gold earring. That seemed more significant than being a Marxist on an American campus, at least to me as a fresh-eyed freshman student. On the second Friday of November 1989, he came into the classroom, threw his notes into the air and exclaimed, in a mixture of joy and disbelief, I don't know what to teach in class today. The date was November 10th, 1989, and the day before the Berlin Wall had fallen with astonishing speed. Chris had been in the middle of a two-week module about Germany after World War II. You can imagine how he felt with his notes suddenly becoming useless. At a rushed press conference in East Germany, Gunter Schabowski, a high-ranking East German official, was asked at a chaotic press conference when free movement would be allowed. He is supposed to have said in German, at once, immediately, but done so by accident and without any consultation with the Central Committee. And from that accidental statement, the abrupt human tide to smash down the Berlin Wall overnight. Two years later, the Soviet Union shattered into 13 different countries. Yugoslavia was about to enter into a prolonged period of war and its own breakup. Generations that had grown up with the specter of an ambitious red empire watched the end of an imperial project that bankrupted itself from inside. But this narrative of the end of socialism pins its ends to two European poles, divided Germany and United Soviet Union, and maybe we can add United Yugoslavia. With the end of these projects in 1989 and 1991, Red Utopia is supposed to have come to an end. But for those of us looking to center the story of the socialist century outside of Europe, although always in relationship to it, whether friendly or unfriendly, the adoption of socialism by newly decolonizing nations of the third world from the 1950s to the 1970s offers a more productive viewpoint for thinking through other histories. In particular, the idea of socialism as a contagion. Unfriendly people would call it a disease. We, the friendly people, might also think of it as a disease. A project of human emancipation that spreads like a virus from one country to the next. This idea is better tested with all its contradictions within the Third World Solidarity Project, variously experienced here in 1955 in Bandung, Indonesia, in the Movement for Afro-Asian Solidarity, or in 1973 in the flawed movement that my film is about, the Non-Aligned Movement. After all, what we know most about the years after 1917 is that the Soviet Union fails to spread communism to other countries. There are uprisings in Germany and France, but they all fail. So socialism remains trapped in one country. And the argument for uh, totalitarian Leninism and Stalinism afterwards is partially the argument that this is the way we have to rule since we're surrounded by enemies a self-serving explanation to be sure. 
But if you want to look at an example of socialism and its all its flavors actually spreading from country to country, the largest number of countries that adopt this idea are the countries that start becoming independent after World War II, primarily focused in the Middle East, uh, Asia, and Africa. I want to talk briefly about the four films I made prior to uh, this film that's at Magba, very briefly. Uh, the first one, uh, United Red Army in 2011, primarily concerns the ultra-left movement of the Japanese Red Army, primarily known as a radical terrorist group, which takes on the idea of world socialism, but decides to express itself through solidarity with the Palestinian movement. And in this film, they crash into the Bangladeshi left when they decide to hijack a plane and hijack the plane to Bangladesh. In the second film in the series, Afsan's Long Day, uh, the film concerns the collision between the Maoists inside Bangladesh and those in India and how when the left in Bangladesh and in India try to build solidarity, it is crushed first and foremost by the Bangladeshi and the Indian government, who call themselves socialists, but don't want the Maoists to take control and decide to take authoritarian steps to take control of them, which will sound familiar in many contexts. The third film in the series is Last Man in Dhaka Central, made in 2015. And this was about a, a Dutch journalist who was in a PhD program at Johns Hopkins. So in this, I feel some sympathy because I'm also at the last stages of a PhD program. Although I don't think I will do what he did, which is that uh, halfway through his program, he drops out, leaves the United States and moves to Bangladesh to join the underground rebellion. And influenced by an idea that authentic left solidarity can be found only in the third world, and influenced by what I would consider a very sweet but also naive idea that as a European, he will blend into an Asian country and be able to be within secret underground groups and not be noticed. The reality, of course, is tragically different, as he finds out. The fourth film in the series was Abu Amar is Coming, completed in 2016. Uh, it was a short film specifically about the search for the background of this photograph taken by Chris Steele Perkins of Magnum, uh, where Chris's photograph is titled Bangladeshi Fighters in the PLO. Uh, and I spent a year trying to track down this photograph and the story I had heard that there were thousands of Bangladeshis who joined the PLO. Uh, and the story I eventually found is that they were part of a migrant labor chain uh, brought to Lebanon uh, in the hopes of jobs. There were jobs for sure, but the jobs were as employees of an organization called Fatah, which is Yasser Arafat's faction of the PLO, which briefly in 1981 was at least wealthy enough to be able to play, pay uh, migrant workers who were working as mercenaries. So it's also a film about what it means to join a movement when you don't know what you're joining. Uh, the fifth film in the series, also the first uh, three-channel film within the project, is Two Meetings and a Funeral, which is at Magba. And perhaps the easiest way to understand the difference between the four films before and this one is that the four films before are all about variations of the left trying to get to power, using almost always violent means to overthrow an existing state, sometimes even a state that calls itself socialist, but obviously not socialist enough and what happens when the violent movements go wrong. Two meetings and a funeral is about what happens when you actually come to power. Uh, most of the leaders uh, in this film, uh, from Muammar al-Gaddafi to Castro, came to power through what would be considered um, uprisings, except these are uprisings that succeed, therefore they become liberation wars. And the film is somewhat about what happens uh, when you come to power. It's not so surprising, um, as Hannah Arendt uh, famously said, that too much time was spent talking about decolonization, not enough time talking about what sort of leadership will take over after liberation. And in almost every single one of these countries, the leadership that takes over um, is disappointing. So this is a short clip from the film. In every clip I show here, you'll see it as a one screen, but of course in the actual film, each screen is paired with uh, two other screens which you won't see here. So you see one third of the story even here. This is Gaddafi arriving um, at uh, uh, Algiers airport, about to be greeted by Boumedian. The backstory of this video footage, which I'll say in advance, is that uh, when I saw this footage for the first time in Algerian television, 
uh, somebody who works there in the archives and has same obsessions that I do said, well, this is the second version. And I said, what do you mean it's the second version? He said, well, when Gaddafi first steps off the plane, he has his uh, gun, his pistol with a side holster uh, across his uniform. And then he's told you have to take that gun off before you step down or the president of Algeria won't meet you. So then he goes back inside the plane, takes the gun off and then steps off again. So this is the footage the second time around. By 1973, these same left forces have come to power in governments that, at least on paper, profess some allegiance to socialist principles. Even Libya is called the Socialist and Islamic Republic at that time. With Bandung unable to contain these new geographic formulations, the non-aligned movement rises to its place. Now the membership is widened perhaps too wide to take in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and a larger swath of the Arab world. In reality, many practice ruthless authoritarianism at home while they preach liberation here in Algeria. They also tolerate dictators in their club, as the non-aligned movement includes, as we see in the full footage, many army officers who have come to power in fresh military coups. Within the non-aligned movement, those belonging to Arab countries practice a bizarre mixture of, in some cases, Islamism and socialism. All of this is kept alive by petrodollars. 1973 is the beginning of OPEC oil power. By 1979, the non-aligned movement has collapsed and nowhere more clearly than the failure of this movement to condemn the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The same Castro who embraces the Vietnamese delegation here as freedom fighters in 1973, six years later refuses to see the Afghan insurgency against the Soviets as a similar battle. None of the cameramen choose to ask these questions either. They're all focused on getting the best shot. Perhaps it is too much to expect anyone to ask these questions in 73. What I do know is the largest number of press cameras surround Castro, taking images from every angle, here ignoring the Bangladesh delegation that is in front of them. In fact, the Bangladesh delegation seats are in the way of getting a clear photograph of Castro. How tragic it is that it is Ronald Reagan who cynically embraces a portion of the Afghan resistance against the Soviets as freedom fighters and makes sure that the portion that receives a White House visit has not even the smell of communism. That leaves, of course, the Islamists in all their forms, the new friends of the United States, until they are not. Journalists photograph what is in front of them. Nobody notices that Salvador Allende, who was at Castro's side only a year ago, is missing from this event. While the non-aligned movement speaks of world revolution, Allende is trapped inside his palace in Chile. Two days after this conference ends, he is assassinated by General Pinochet's military coup. There can be no greater expression of the failure of this moment. Meanwhile, the photographers keep snapping away. They take photographs of Castro and they make no comments on the people who are missing. <laughs> 
The Singapore Foreign Minister S. Rajaratnam's speech is scheduled for the fifth day. It is an indication of the hierarchy of decolonized countries in 1973 that both Singapore and Malaysia are scheduled for the end of the conference, the end when not many want to speak. The first days are all the superpowers within this regional configuration. Castro, of course, but also Tito of Yugoslavia and Indira Gandhi of India. Cuba, Yugoslavia, and India are the three key leaders of the non-aligned movement. Perhaps Gamal Nasser would have been there too, but he had died a few years earlier. And his inheritor, Egypt's Anwar Sadat, was seen with suspicion at this conference. By day five, the high profile speakers have already presented their keynote speeches. Some may have already left the country. At the least, they are no longer attentive speakers. The conference has entered that doldrum familiar to anyone who has ever attended a meeting that goes on too long, or a speech, or a seminar. Your mind starts to drift even though you know important things are being said. You're also unaware that the television cameras have a long range. You share stories and talk to your friends unaware that the video record is being set. Perhaps there is a story or anecdote to share. Maybe the speaker on stage said something humorous. That rarely happens here. But no, this laughter does not seem related to the stage. What I keep noticing is that the headphones are off. You wonder when the break will come for coffee and that endless cigarette. But an anachronism is revealed in the way I narrate a script of impatience and waiting. Coffee and cigarettes are what I insert as the elements that are waiting impatient delegates. But this is 1973 a time when you can freely smoke inside airplanes, in lobbies, in offices, cafeterias, and certainly at a conference. The Afghan delegate is certainly not waiting for a break. One hand on the headphone and one hand taking a peace drag. He has no idea really that in six years, the Soviet Union will invade his country and this August conference will sit silently. So, not cigarettes, not coffee. Maybe it is boredom and ceremony alone that have made an audience that is largely inattentive to Rajaratnam's speech. You note again and again the delegates who have their headphones off. And the record tells you that the Iraqi delegation did not understand English well enough to skip the translation. And what a speech to miss one that anchors a strange third way within the idea of internation solidarity. But perhaps there are other events going on at home. Anwar Sadat is already planning to break with the Arab Pact five years later and sign the Camp David peace treaty with Israel. An event that would lead to Egypt being boycotted within this event. And in 1981, Sadat's assassination by the group that would later become one nucleus of Al-Qaeda. The television technology of 1973 does not allow for verite or fly on the wall filming. A large bulky camera can only do standard sweeps of the audience and cannot always zoom in. But even with that minimal movement, you can see that the crowd has thinned and attention faded. The technology is provided by French and German television, obliquely panned by Rajaratnam himself in his speech. Yesterday, Mr. Chairman, for some reason, we had a technical breakdown. All the equipment that we are using to threaten the big powers is provided by them. 
It broke down and we could not communicate. We are all sitting here in planes made and built by the great powers. Without that, we cannot hold this conference. We sent telegrams to our home countries. We had to send one to Singapore. It had to go to Paris, London, Singapore. They turn it off. We are lost. Rajaratnam sends the boredom and began with a promise that he would deliver the shortest speech of this conference. He began by breaking the fourth wall with a reference to the prepared speech he already provided to the interpretation and translation team. Everyone had or would receive a printed copy. This was his rationale to skip the officially approved text and deliver extempore remarks. And as a gesture of appreciation, what I propose to do in deference to his request is to table my lengthy and perhaps tedious compilation of thoughts formally to be inscribed into the records of this conference. And instead, I shall comment, confine myself to making a brief summary of the main speech. And I would commend this practice in future conferences because first it will enable distinguished delegates to make the longest speech ever recorded in the time that is necessary to table it before a conference. Secondly, it will enable them to do something which has never been done before, to make two speeches at one conference for the price of one airline ticket. <laughs> the comments come after days of dramatic denunciatory speeches and could be read as a veiled dig at the record-breaking speeches of Castro and Tito, both over one hour, or the triumphant Vietnam delegation, almost one hour. Sinathampi Rajaratnam was always known as S. Rajaratnam, a short story writer and journalist before becoming part of Singapore's independence group with Lee Kuan Yew. He is an odd fit within this solidarity concept. A member of the University Socialist Club during the period of British dominion, he evolved in independent Singapore as the minister and deputy prime minister most, in, most invested in that island country's stability. Through multiracial pledge and eventually battling what he considered ultra-left or communist influence, he made an uneasy fit in Algeria of 1973. His personal history also showed a path of always moving around and refusing to fit within identities. He was born in Sri Lanka but brought to Malaya by his parents prior to independence. He studied at Raffles and moved to London to study law and then there married Piroshka Feher, a Hungarian teacher. He was recruited by George Orwell to do TV radio serials for the BBC, and in 1954 started writing, I Write As I Please, which eventually, of course, got him into trouble with the British government. Eventually, he joined the People's Action Party with Lee Kuan Yew and became foreign minister of the newly independent country, as part of which he continuously moved very small Singapore into alliances, including most famously ASEAN or the Southeast Asian nation trade bloc. And it seems in 73, he was here trying to argue that what the Socialist Alliance should be talking about is trade alliances and not liberation movements. He showed a strange path into another route that non-alignment and even solidarity did not take. <laughs> 
Mr. President, this is almost the tail end of nearly one week of speeches and deliberations. And I've asked myself, to whom have we been communicating this last one week? To whom have we been talking? To ourselves? Or to the two billion people we are supposed to represent? What is it that they would require of our non-aligned conference? Have we provided them the solutions that our peoples have been asking? And this is the question I have been asking myself. <coughs> and I shall try and give my views. But before I do so, a saying by a well-known anti-Nazi, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said in prison, in times of crisis, there can be no set rules to govern our thoughts. We must therefore take the risk of saying things that are open to dispute. First, the thing that exercised our attention the last few days is the role of non-alignment. A great deal has been said that because of the detente, power politics, Cold War is over. That there have been winds of change going through international relations. My view is there has been merely a change of winds. The old Cold War has ended, true, and we are grateful because it gives us time to sort our problems. It is an intermission between an old Cold War and the new Cold Wars which are looming over the horizon and rumbles of which were heard in this chamber the last few days. It is not our business as non-aligned countries to fight the battles of the big powers. They can look after themselves. I am not sure whether we can look after ourselves. A break in protocol then, followed by sharp remarks on trade, economic cooperation, birth control and oil dependence. At one point, Rajaratnam does a calculation of how many children are born per minute, then per hour, then per day. He ends by giving a calculation of how many children were born since the conference began. He does a calculation of five days and then reminds the audience that 70% of these children were born in the third world that the conference represents. And that is the lead into saying, what will these speeches do for them? But as TV cameras pan the audience, you see again that the important leader's headphones are again off their ears. They're not listening to his words. What do you think of uh, choosing Algiers as a uh, place for this conference? It's okay. Well, I think it's a very it's fine. It's almost over. apt choice, partly for personal reasons, because in 1965, I was here in Algiers to attend a non-aligned conference which never took place. So for that reason, I'm happy to be back again in Algeria and attend a conference. Secondly, I think the, the, uh, the fact that this part of the world is, uh, and especially Algeria, is uh, developing and uh, important uh, 
country in the Mediterranean area. So I think it's quite right that we should meet here and discuss the problem of non-aligned countries, especially in North Africa, is largely non-aligned countries, that we should meet in Africa to discuss the problem of non-alignment in the light of the new situation, as I indicated earlier. The new situation that Rajaratnam is referring to is the signing of the first SALT treaty, the Strategic Arms Limitations Talks, a treaty between the United States and the USSR. The first major treaty in the 70s that pledges to reduce the amount of arms, nuclear arms produced by each country. If non-alignment was partially premised on a socialist solidarity that would be outside of alignment with either of the Cold War powers, especially the Soviet Union, what Rajaratnam was asking here is what happens when your entire reason for existence is taken away by a treaty between the two superpowers against whom you've presented yourself as non-aligned. What remains after opposition disappears. The pivot moment in third world solidarity, in my opinion, came not only in a fatal dependence on oil power by 1973, but in a failure to comprehend Rajaratnam's provocation. We all agree on what we are against, but what exactly are we for? I said at the beginning that I had been asked why I work on the 1970s, and I gave a partial explanation that it was the last decade of a socialist hope before 1979, which I consider more important to the third world socialist project than 1989 uh, as an endpoint. The other question I get asked is why make films on the parts of the left which end always, it seems, in tragedy, uh, with defeat, with failure, with betrayal, with a lot of sorrow. And you see it even in this film. And what I have been thinking, and this doesn't just come from me, but others who have been working on forms of narrative, uh, including Hayden White uh, on tragedy, is that the history of this period, of course, is suffused with uh, tragedy and regret. Almost everyone I interview um, has some regret, while in some cases also they feel obliged to present in front of me, supposedly the next generation, uh, optimistic message. So an interview will be sad, but will end with, but we have to keep fighting. Uh, but I think what I argue or what I want to argue is that it's also okay to stay within a melancholic tone um, in telling these stories, that a melancholic tone at the end of a film, as there is at the end of two meetings, um, isn't failure. Um, it's a form of narrative that can lead to thinking about what next, not in the sense of a manual. None of these films are meant to be instruction manuals in any way whatsoever, uh, but they're meant to be talking about a situation that I identify as now promise, now failure, always wrapped up together. And I find it productive to stay within that for a little bit longer and not to speed ahead to a story of inevitable victory. Because I think victory is going to come in other forms, not in a form of inevitable, which has been both the hallmark of a certain socialist project and of course, uh, religion. So I leave you here with uh, the final scene from the film, uh, which has a backstory also, but you'll see both a touch of optimism and a little bit of sadness and I think the sadness is also okay to stay with for this project. So here we have Samia Zennadi, Algerian publisher, and Vijay Prashad, Indian author, uh, the two key protagonists of the film. And at the end of the film, also at the end of a long couple of days of filming, when they're also uh, feeling the exhaustion of the process, as well as the story. So this movie basically is a war against forgetting. Ah. And uh, this is going to help uh, bridge the gap between the ancients and the young. Oh, good. I think. Ah, uh, yes, I'm happy to hear this. This is <laughs> what I think that is the problem. Uh, that gap will be closed. Ah, you think? I think so. Okay. So That's why people make movies. So bring, bring many copies because the gap is, uh, wide. is uh, very, very wide in, in my country. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Thank you.
So I think now we can have the lights on so we can see each other again and maybe maybe your own thoughts. Um, uh, I don't really have... Yes. Yes, I have headphones. Sure, it's a great question. And thank you for bringing up uh, Tripoli Cancelled, uh, which is not shown here, so I'll just give a slight background for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, it came out, it was made roughly at the same time at, as this film, uh, nine months apart. The one commonality between the two is that uh, the director of photography for the Algeria section of two meetings, uh, Petros Nusias, is the same cinematographer for the entire uh, film Tripoli Cancelled, which is set in Athens. Uh, it's basically a story of a man who lives in an airport. Uh, he seems to be a prisoner, but there's no sign of any guards or fences. So it's unclear why he doesn't leave. Uh, I thought a little bit about the novel and film Lost Horizon, where at the very end when the characters leave Shangri-La, the moment they leave, they turn into dust. And it's revealed that they've been in a state of suspended animation. Maybe that was going on, maybe not. Um, it's a week in that man's life, and you're correct, uh, there is a lot of melancholy in him, but um, the strange optimism is that he say, goes through the same ritual every week. Because if you take the number of days and you divide through, you realize he's been there for 10 years. Um, so surely this can't be the first time that he does this ritual, yet he does it every week, including starting with shaving. So there's a, a small element of hope. Um, this won't make so much sense for those who haven't seen the film, but he calls his wife once a week and he never gets through, but he always hopes that the next time he'll call, she'll pick up. Um, it's of course not tied to a particular political project, uh, just a loneliness of this person, which of course can be some sort of condition inside modernity, cannot be, um, I didn't say all that. Um, two, meeting, uh, two meetings and a funeral, um, so the key difference, of course, is Tripoli Cancel is fiction. So I had control over the script and two meetings I don't. Um, the only control I have is choosing what to include and what not. Right. So there's a so there's a tension in this film, which is that Vijay Prashad, especially um, he sees his role. And I think his role is similar to others who are taking an active political role right now, including something that's a bit out of fashion, but he's still doing it, which is to be an internationalist. He doesn't say I'm an expert on India. Um, you know, that can also raise issues, but he continuously comments on uh, what he identifies as left developments in the Arab world, in Latin America, in Africa. And there can be critiques of how do you speak about places where you don't speak the language, the idea of specialists. He is invested in praxis in a very particular way. I'm going to continue to go out and inspire people. So he's in the film and he has a different project, even though he's agreed to be in the film. Uh, he he is continuously in Algeria seeking for the moment of hope, even while not denying how things went wrong. And then the film does this thing, which is of course in the editing, which is that the choices made lean more towards sadness. Right? So this scene, which ends the film, he said to me afterwards, laughing of course, but still kind of uh, doing a slight, I think raised finger, uh, gentle one, saying that, oh, that was the extra. Um, it's actually right before Samia needs to go for a cigarette break also. Um, and, and so there are those things going on as well. And he says, well, that's the extra, all the important parts. That's what you, so there are parts where he gave what he thought was the summary. 
right? And if you hear the summary, it's not clear at all why the movement didn't work out. That's what always my problem is with the optimistic summary. Because if everything was in the right place and it was the right leaders at the right time, the right decisions, then it should absolutely have worked out. Um, and so I'm always leaning more towards these places where there's a gap between both what somebody like Vijay might say and the speeches, right? I mean, Gaddafi gives a great speech and then goes on to conspire behind the scenes to bring Bangladesh into his fold as a Muslim country, an identity that Bangladesh is at that point trying to refuse. Um, I mean, conventionally, I think uh, the criticism I've received, which is also a fair criticism from friends who are activists and we've grown up together in the movement, is that to have this much melancholy is demobilizing because you're, um, you're, you're stuck with this moment and you're with the sadness. That will actually prevent you from getting involved in the next movement. I don't think so, um, but I'm also not suggesting that watching this film is going to make you take to the ramparts because it's not that kind of project either. Um, I mean, I think a couple of years ago, I would have said and I thought that, okay, if I stay with the sadness, out of this is going to come a better political project. But I feel it won't be that way because the movement won't be the same next time either. It won't look anything like this. Um, I mean, perhaps for me, the role of Islamism is of course always important and still um, something to deal with in countries also trying to have a left politics where obviously over the last 30 years Islamism has been more attractive as an ideology um, and has been able to pull up a much larger already interpolated um, audience and socialism hasn't right so in Bangladesh now there's all this discussion about uh, the main discussion is, oh, we made a mistake because Marx and all of this was Western thoughts and we could never even figure out how to translate dialectic. I mean, there is a translation for dialectic, which is Dandik Bostubad, which if you say it to anybody in Bengali, it, it sounds, it's really, it's not Bengali that appeals to you. It's really difficult. And so the argument is, oh, we tried to translate all these Western Marxism into our thought and yet Islam as an ideology was already available. And why couldn't you have looked inside Islam for the language of social liberation? That's that's a longer debate. Um, so I think I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm of course dying to make a more optimistic, cheerful project. Um, and my way of doing it within these films is always there's a there's a slight skid on the needle when there's an unexpected moment. Um, almost always the outtake, um, and that becomes the way to include a little bit of unexpected humor, which certainly lightens the mood for me, but that's certainly not all 89, 88 minutes, right? So there's still a mood of, you know, what could have been sort of thing. This is also a strange and different film because the architecture is, while I, the film is talking about the problem with this architecture, people are still overwhelmed by the architecture, right? So they still find it grand, even while the narration is telling you that this grandness was, so there's a strange, uh, back and forth as well. Um, the other thing I'll say is, of course, a lot of this thinking about it is only afterwards. I filmed and edited in a very instinctive way. And only later did we say, oh, this doesn't work, you know, or this feels too optimistic, something's going on. Um, the other thing, of course, is when you're shooting three channel, you don't get the accidental moments in the micro bus or at dinner afterwards where they're having a re so that's the other thing, right, which is it's documentary, but it's not, you know, I made a reference to the cameras being very heavy in the Non-Aligned Movement Summit. Our camera was also very heavy. So we couldn't, because we were shooting for a certain context of making a three-channel film, that means we couldn't catch the spontaneous moments. So I, I would have loved to make a film that includes the spontaneous moment where also somebody like Vijay will let down his need to educate and just sort of say, yes, it also really was, it was a disaster. He'll say that, but then the camera, you know, he has an, op, you know, he runs an institution. Since this film was made, he left university and started this institution. So there's, you know, he has a different project. We are friends and allies, but we are in two different spaces and there are convergences here and there are divergences as well. Yes, yeah. Which I think particularly films don't have the obligation necessarily to finish everything. I think it's especially understood that this is just a beginning of a provocation. For example, anyone from Yugoslavia has commented that Tito's hardly there. 
I mean, you see Toto for a few moments. You see his wife uh, in that blue uh, dress for a few moments, and that's it. I deliberately didn't include Tito, partially because his speeches are so large, I couldn't find a two-minute portion. And so, Yugoslav scholars have written things, their own things, where they sometimes include a criticism of this. And I feel like that's fantastic that they are then able to say, well, these are all the things that are missing. Um, and I think you couldn't write a book or an essay and do the same thing, right? An essay would have much more an obligation to be complete. Um, at least in the academic form. Thanks for the talk, Naeem. Um, you just mentioned architecture. So in addition to the human protagonists that are in your film, um, you've also chosen to include, I mean, architecture space is, is a very, uh, very important <coughs> element. And you made a selection of uh, transnational architecture, which features very prominently uh, in, in the film. Can you talk a little bit about how you see these uh, elements as almost containers of mm. uh, history and, and what your decision was to include them and why those specific sites? Mm. Well, Tripoli Cancelled also has um, a certain kind of grand architecture project. It's the building designed by uh, Eero Sarinen. Um, and because it's a heritage site, might be why it's never been uh, broken down, even though the airport in Athens has been closed since 2001. But that's, of course, a different project because that airport, airport, that airport or airports in general weren't necessarily built with a socialist ideal or nation-building ideal, but different kind of nation, nation as transit. Um, and nation as international, right? Um, as countries become more economically confident, they build one of these giant airports, and typical thing is to bring in an international architect. Um, for the non-aligned movement or for the socialist project in general, uh, the most obvious thing is that the buildings are all that remains, actually, right? Um, there are documents, which are not, which were not the visual element that I wanted to work with. There are speeches, of course, but the singular element that remains are the buildings. And then what's interesting is that, for me, is that Algeria is where the buildings are quite intact and also unused. Um, that uh, building where the conference took place is now in a military guarded area. It's still used, but it's um, it's used very selectively. You have to get special permissions. So the, the, so the space is completely um, intact. And then people do rituals like um, in the film, there's a scene where they're changing the tablecloths. You know, they do that every day, even if there's not a conference. You have to keep it clean, so you dust it every day. So the ghosts of the movement are there in the building that's unused. And then not necessarily by design, but while doing the filming, we realized that, okay, in Algeria, it's kind of frozen. In New York, which is the counter, right? The non-aligned movement is also trying to be the anti-United Nations. In New York, the United Nations is working. Right, which is where the New York sequences are shot, but in a way working without meaning, right? I mean, we don't necessarily follow UN proceedings thinking uh, on Friday there will be a resolution and that will be the, the United Nations has become the ultimate empty signifier now. Um, but the building's still intact and it's highly regimented also when you can go in, you can't go into the United Nations at any time. So that also felt like a different kind of emptiness um, even while being used. And then in Dhaka, which is end of the film, the non-aligned movement building is hyper used for contemporary commercial uses. You can rent it for, I, I mean, I've gone to a wedding there uh, of a um, friend, and when we were shooting, there was a trade fair. So it's actually extremely used because maybe in Bangladesh, maybe in that context, you can't afford to leave any building um, empty. So that was the reason. Um, I've always been interested in architecture a little bit. Um, and then of course, uh, visually, the stadium gave this amazing opportunity to just walk through, but also, um, without necessarily intending to, that's the place where there was a real sharp break between Vijay's wish to be optimistic and the reality. Because, you know, he walks into the conference and he sees all these chairs and they're neatly covered in white cloth. And then he touches a chair and says, oh, this is where Arafat sat and he feels something. Then he goes to the stadium and it's a stadium and it's not used for anything, at least not when we were there. And I think there was this moment, it's in the film, where he's just overwhelmed by... He doesn't say the word waste, but it feels very much like an empty monument because it has an interior that's supposed to be used. So for Vijay, it became a moment where something dislodged, where which brought him more in line to where I was, where I'm behind the camera and then I'm listening to him and then we're having this moment. And then, of course, we stop running the camera and we just, you know, because, of course, we wish something different. We wish the stadium was full 
we wish that epic moment. I mean, we'd all like to film the actual event rather than the residue, right? Um, and yeah, the buildings become a way to, you know, think through that. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to add something. Um, I think it's similar to what I had said earlier to your question. A lot of this is after the fact, right? And one of the one of the things that I find interesting and also complicating is we are now in a I think context where work is shown and then there's conversations around it. And I think specifically with the non-aligned movement, there's now academic work happening around it. And I find. So I'm also in a graduate school program, but not doing research on this particular thing. So I have a split persona or split head where one part of it is obliged to go deeper into, you know, chasing down one footnote and, you know, just chasing it to its end. Versus in the film, you have liberty not to do that. And I think when these things are crossing, which they have for me in conferences or even in conversations like this where, you know, we, you know, conversations have moved away in my experience from, uh, you know, so how exactly did the Nolan movement end? What was the scene with 79? It's moved away from the specifics of the data to more an affective space around it, which also I think is influenced by academic discourse. And I'm in it, I participate in it, but I also think it's sort of, you know, I'm always happy that it didn't happen while I was shooting the film, because while I'm shooting the film, I, I want to be, you know, I want to actually forget all the books I've read about this, because I don't want to in that moment, because I don't want the films to be a proof of the hypothesis. Um, you know, and, and most of the film, the things we planned and shot weren't what we used. The accidental moments are what we ended up using. There's a moment in the film where the young Algerian man um, is talking to Vijay and Vijay is trying to ask him optimistic questions. And he says, maybe people are trying to br build a bridge from Algeria to America, which maybe is about migration and jobs. And it's not the answer that maybe Vijay expects. And then Vijay asks him another optimistic question. And then he just is sort of silent. And he says, maybe. And then there's this very awkward silence. And to me, that awkward silence is the moment where the enthusiastic leader uh, or polemicist in Vijay encounters a young Algerian who isn't fitting with what he hopes, right? Um, but neither, neither are they getting into an argument. They're just sitting there. And that moment is sufficient for me. But if I have to talk about that moment in... Uh, the language of analysis, then the moment breaks down for me. So I'm constantly sort of also thinking about how much to talk about a film or how much to just let it be and let it be mysterious. I think the reason people have liked the film in Eastern Europe is very different from why I thought about it. They have a completely different project and I haven't understood their project yet, right? Um, and, I, and I think it's okay for me not to understand that project also. So it's very superficial now. I mean, it's it's not an organization. I mean, you don't even hear about it when the meetings happen. It has hardly any funds. The Bangladesh version of the non-aligned movement got canceled because of lack of budget. Uh, but 79, I wasn't just talking about non-alignment, um, but also the end of the third world solidarity project. Because 79, many, I mean, Thatcherism is ascendant. Reaganism is about to come in. Uh, the Iran hostage crisis and the invasion um, of Afghanistan, as well well as whatever socialist governments are there have already by 79 you can't really call Libya a socialist government anymore you know unless socialism is defined by taking oil wealth and giving everybody a basic income so that they don't riot that's not you know he didn't he never figured out how to create any productive industry um, I mean I we lived in Libya in the 70s because Libya was importing uh, skilled labor to build up their uh, industry so my father's a doctor we stayed for four and a half years and then we left. That's not a way that you build up your economy, but it's enough as a stopgap, right? So oil is also the deceiving part of this. 79, everything starts kind of coming apart. It doesn't come apart in 1980. It still takes another 10, 15, 20 years. But I think if you're really looking at the moment, 79 is the last moment of optimism, right? I mean, there are other uh, revolutions that fail like Granada in 1983. But by 1983, Granada failing is not a surprise because you've already seen... 
maybe for me, what I always remember is when Salvador Allende is assassinated, the language around it is that this time the capitalists and America have gone too far. Now there will be a boomerang. Instead of a boomerang, actually that begins the rise of complete control of a certain project in Latin America. So that doesn't mean you give up hope, but this sort of feeling that one after another country is falling as a domino, becoming independent, becoming decolonized, and as soon as they become independent, the first thing they say is we're a socialist country, that trend started dramatically dropping. Uh, and for me, I wanted to have 79 because I wanted to separate out from 89, which the European-centered history of the end of the socialist project is always 89, 91, you know, um, Soviet Union, as I mentioned, Germany and Yugoslavia kind of together. And the assumption that all of that is radiating outwards from Europe to everywhere else, as opposed to I see it actually that the third world countries that are, doing, that are trying to do socialism are also starting to collapse much earlier than that. Or not collapse, but leave socialism. Oh, there's a question. Um, well, I just want to ask if you have any thoughts to share about your expectations or your interest in showing the film here in Spain or particularly in Barcelona and how it might resonate in another context of uh, leftist politics, perhaps you know, thinking back to the 1930s here in uh, the Republic. I mean, I'm interested in how the language about independence in here resonates. Um, I've observed people watching the film over the last two days, and I don't, I mean, I don't know what people are thinking, but you can see a difference in the response, at least in terms of head motions and attention and how much between a visibly younger generation and older generation. So I don't know if that, my guess is that perhaps an audience that has experienced some of these moments um, are having the flash of recognition of a similar situation. And I would expect somebody in their 20s to be seeing this for the first time, any of this, right? Um, and so if you're in your 20s, you might never have seen Gaddafi except as a caricature at the end, right? Um, you know, right before Gaddafi collapses, there's a music video made out of a speech um, of his where he just sort of says, we will fight them everywhere. And that it's, it's like an electro, I mean, it's the height of, uh, parody built into the person and if you're a 20 something person that's all you might know of Gaddafi if you know him at all and for a certain generation there was a brief period when Gaddafi seemed to be a revolutionary figure and seemed to be doing some things right and then it all starts going astray um, so I don't know I, um, I, I don't know what the response will be here but I hope it will sort of percolate somehow in ways that I can I mean I, I really um, appreciated it when it was shown in um, Slovenia and there was an argument about all the flaws of the film because of course there are flaws in the film and um, it's um, willfully um, not about Yugoslavia at all even though um, Yugoslavs would feel that we are central to the non-aligned movement. Um, so I hope that something happens here which is all about what are the gaps, right? Um, either what are the gaps in the film which of course there are multitude or also about you know what are the other stories that it um, triggers in people's minds that's an inadequate answer because I actually don't know um, what to expect but I did think to myself uh, oh also it's the first time it's translated and being shown in this format so I'm also into I'm, I haven't quite figured out what people are looking at whether they're listening at least for the English and French part or whether they're reading um, and if they're reading, whether they're reading the English or the Spanish, and of course the material moves around the screen. So I haven't been able to figure out yet what people are watching. Hi, uh, you were mentioning a bit before that you're activist colleagues feel mad with you about the melancholy and that it lacks optimism. So I want to know if when you're making the films, if, if you feel like an activist or if you draw a line between the activist like in real life, in your daily life and the filmmaker. <coughs> and the second question is, uh, you were mentioning oil and distribution of a basic income through oil then immediately Venezuela came to my mind mm. and I want to know, because you have a specific, you work in a specific uh, timeline. Right, so don't you feel tempted to work in a more current 
political situation mm. and if it's somehow like a, a, a protection, I don't know, I mean, what impedes you to, um, I don't know, have some interest on doing something more curious? Um, so, um, many of us get asked the activism question often. Um, I think perhaps uh, because there's a way we all feel it also that we worry that that things well there's a conversation we've had yesterday also the question that we always worry about is you know does the museum reach a mass audience um, or which audience does it reach and does it reach an audience that is trying to do something with this that's the first part the second part is is your work something that's trying to do something immediate right and i think i mean i didn't think of it in that way of what impact it'll have in current thinking. I just exp I just explored what I was interested in, which is the 1970s as the last decade of this hope, which leads me to all these movements, including this. Um, the, the, they're not necessarily mad, but they're surprised and they're questioning and they're also friends. Um, I don't know which other films they're thinking of, but they definitely feel that there's more of the non-heroic story in my films right um because the four films in the series before this one it all kind of ends poorly in fact two meetings is a little different because two meetings you don't see it ending except you find out that many of them died and in those cases you also feel like well if it's a cia sponsored coup that killed them that's an external force that's not internal defeat the earlier films are much more of people you know, sabotaging their movement from within. And I think from a certain kind of active politics right now, that's seen as not not what to highlight, right? Uh, one of my friends in Lebanon said, specifically about the Palestine film, he said, well, the Palestinian movement is already dead and we don't need somebody from Bangladesh to come and kick the corpse some more. Um, I wish you had found a different story. And I said, well, I wish I had too, because I was actually initially excited that these people had crossed and then I couldn't find any um, sign of the crossing but because the stories have tended to well precisely they've been failure because the movement has failed right and not just for external forces I feel like that's the story that comes so I started looking at tragedy as a relevant form because I also wanted to understand what I was doing but it doesn't satisfy someone who's on the front lines right now right it doesn't satisfy Vijay because he's trying to build movements right now um, and building movements does mean you put aside nuance Right? I mean, one of the critiques that Vijay gets is he writes about the Arab world, but he doesn't read Arabic, right? And he would argue that, well, I have to write based on what I know, and yes, there'll be flaws, but I need to write now, um, as opposed to maybe taking 10 years to learn Arabic and then write, right? So it's a, it's a very immediate praxis project. Um, the second question about why the 1970s, I mean, I, I partially answered it that that's the moment that interests me, but also prior to starting this uh, work, from 2000 to 2007, I was in a collective and we specifically worked on post 9-11 security panic in America. And we worked on projects about incarceration of migrant populations after 9-11, um, which now there are a lot of people working on that in the new context of post 2016. But in 2001, we didn't have a lot of allies. Um, the environment was much different then. But by 2007, I did feel with that work that every project we did, whether it was a film or installation, was always responding to a headline. And a headline that was changing while we were working on it. And it felt like, that's fine. That's the mode of a lot of people's work, right? Which is to work on something that's happening right now. And that's actually what's, that, that is actually what feels urgent. For me personally, out of all the collective members, I felt like I was always chasing something that I wasn't resolved about myself. Um, you know, taking on people as protagonists and, and them disappointing me perhaps. And so also going back to the 70s, felt like a way to look at what settled history in a way, because many of these things have stopped moving. But then you talk about petrodollar sustained socialism and whether that's sufficient, immediately you brought up Venezuela. So there's a way that even when I'm talking about something being settled, maybe it's not settled um, for you uh, and it brings up something else. But I think I'm still, um, I, st I think I'm still in the 1970s at least for now. <laughs> we'll see what the next project is. Um, I have a question regarding the, the format of the, of the conferences and uh, in terms of like, your narrative takes on them because it, it, it strikes me as very um, it's kind of addictive to watch these kind of uh, 
hour-long talks and, and where actually nothing really happens and you see a lot of repressed anger, repressed emotions. It's like pretty similar to actually like when I, uh, what's happening here in Spain right now. My, my flatmate, uh, like he's uh, watching daily the trials of the, um, like what happened on the 1st of October in 2017. And it's a strangely addictive type of thing to watch. It's, it's extremely boring, but <laughs> but, uh, but also um, yeah, but also somehow really attractive. And, and um, how your narrative techniques, how your approaches with that. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I would say that if you actually none of the speech excerpts are longer than uh, two three minutes. Um, Quite, con I mean, quite consciously as a way to, well, as a way to fit everybody that I wanted to talk about in. Um, I mean, for me, there's a pleasure that is I'm not able to share with the audience, which is actually listening to the originals, uh, and then listening to originals in Spanish and trying to figure out with my extremely broken Spanish what's being said, even who is this figure, because there's no information about that. Trying to figure out the French in which I'm even less uh, fluent and the Arabic non-existent and sometimes even the English speeches as you'll actually see in the film are dubbed over in Arabic because it's a television feed so you're trying to listen to the English but actually the Arabic is overpowering you even with the Bangladesh Prime Minister it's dubbed in Arabic um, so my own experience with the archive was uh, okay incredibly boring and also uh, opaque because sometimes I'm not even understanding but then also guessing right you're you're watching someone for uh, an hour, you're fast forwarding perhaps, you're with the Algerian television person who also doesn't speak Spanish or French, um, only the Arabic uh, they can speak. So you are sort of in the dark, you're sort of figuring, and then every now and then an English speech will come. So that's why also Rajaratnam jumped out because he speaks this perfect English and he gives this great speech and he's actually funny. And he's, as promised, a short speech actually, he's not even half a tape. Um, and so he jumps out to me after hours and hours of nothing happening. Um, so something about the tedium also makes him really, I mean, I literally remember thinking, who is this person? He's almost like a uh, sort of a, you know, like a surprise arrival, right? And b the headphones are off tell me that people aren't really even listening to him because if they did, surely somebody would be offended because it's a, what are you talking about longer speech? Who are you talking about, right? I mean, our great leader just gave an hour and 10 minute speech. Um, so there's something that happens in that process and I tried to give a little bit of that because the speech excerpts are short, but they're almost always immediately followed by often a piece of text that tells you that the opposite has happened, right? So Sadat gives this great short speech where he says, we'll never be at war with each other and we'll stand for every, each other. And then immediately after the text says that immediately after he signs a peace treaty with Israel, he gets thrown out of these blocks and then by 81 gets assassinated. Or the bit where the Vietnamese uh, delegation gives this short speech and talks about where with Cuba and you see Guantanamo, which is also why I pulled that out because Guantanamo has a contemporary resonance. But as soon as he finishes, the text afterwards, so I do this often, the juxtaposition, uh, which is the opposite actually, the text afterwards tells you that Cuba alone stops the non-aligned movement from condemning Afghanistan, right? So there's also, a, um, maybe that's why some of my, uh, a lot of my activist friends are also uncomfortable with what's happening because you want to like the footage because everybody's young and in their prime and you want to like what they're saying because what they're saying is very good. But soon afterwards, there's a contradiction. And if the contradictions didn't exist, um, the movement wouldn't have collapsed, right? So they talk about liberation, but meanwhile, there's somebody from Latin America wearing full military uniform. So I Google him and I find out that they just had, you know, another military government and that's there. Um, or the longest English uh, press conference, which I didn't use, which is Idi Amin, um, who gives this great, perfect, crisp, kind of British English speech where he says all the right things for Palestine, etc. But it's Idi Amin. And so I think that's one thing I didn't include because I thought if I include Idi Amin, then the whole thing will fall apart because there's nothing you can rescue after that. Because if Idi Amin can talk about Palestine, then solidarity with Palestine doesn't mean anything if a mass murderer can talk about it, right? So, so there was, you know, I mean, I wish I could take all that footage and do a separate project where everybody gets to watch it because, um, you know, there's many extraordinary things in there that, well, then it would have been a five hour long film. So that's why um, it's not in there. Yeah. But yeah, long speeches, there's, 
they're tedious, but then something also comes out of it. Um, you start noticing other things. Sorry, just one more thing. Um, uh, Indira Gandhi, uh, there's a bit where she's talking, but she gets a cough and she starts coughing. And she does this whole thing, which you can only watch if you slow it down, where in one hand she's opening up this little box and she takes out cloves. Um, you know, very Indian re or whatever, very familiar remedy to her for, and she like sort of keeps giving her speech and slips into her mouth and starts doing this whole thing, you know, maybe not aware of the camera or maybe not caring. You see that whole thing. I didn't end up using it, but I thought, oh, those are the moments also when people are sort of, they're being human, right? They, they have a prepared speech, but she has a coughing attack and she doesn't want to lose her time. So she does what she knows how to do. Um, so there are some moments like that, which maybe are in the film, but not so visible because you get to see it at normal speed. And I saw it slowed down and repeated while I was doing the research. So archive research is fantastic for that reason. And you never get to share all that you found out um, in the actual film. to hear your thoughts on this new documentary that came out, produced by Netflix on uh, Ocasio Cortez and this whole new movement in the States where women are trying to enter into political decision making in their respective states. And the, the fact that Netflix, such a huge producer, like the alternative to Hollywood, they say, is uh, producing political docu-series and mm -hmm. what that does for the um, dissemination of, uh, well, that crossover between pop culture and politics mm -hmm. and where documentary enters into that and how the life now of uh, Ocasio-Cortez has become, you know, something we all follow. Um, there are snippets of her on YouTube um, talking back to um, white, older um, men. Um, so I'm just wondering whether pop culture is going to subsume again this uh, generation or, or this movement of hope. Mm. Because I think there's a glimmer of hope now. And growing up in a society that is completely ruled by fear or by the culture of fear, we want to look for hope. This is, you know, why I was so interested in your take on melancholy and mm. um, why you are not, um, wh how, how come you're not escaping the 70s? So, um, yeah. That's is, is, part of you, uh, is part of you worried that it's on Netflix? Is that, are you worried that that will take away from AOC's Lots of lots of people can see it, and it makes it available to a large audience uh, in a way that maybe it wouldn't be uh, available otherwise. But on the same, at the same time, when the same producer is producing a whole ton of other mm -hmm. stuff, it can get the intentions are unclear, <coughs> and I don't know yet what Netflix is or mm -hmm. is becoming but it can definitely determine taste or you know you have your own playlist and it, it <coughs> suggests things to you to watch that based on what you already watched. So um, it, it's another mechanism, it's another extension uh, or it kind of functions like Google, you know, mm -hmm. where it, it, it suggests movies to you, it's like targeted advertisement in a way. And um, I just, I'm worried that by making it uh, too, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know why I'm worried. I'm mm. just <laughs> <laughs> well, you're also probably aware that you're probably seeing the Ocasio Cortez preview more than others because Netflix knows enough about you. Same reason I get them. Uh, what do the people say? Netflix knows you better than you know yourself. Um, and Netflix is just a empty bucket for the larger concern perhaps about well, I think 
uh, I mean, there's no there's no end to the discussion around that question. But for example, a similar anxiety I've heard expressed when, um, you know, first of all, she is a pop phenomenon now, right? So the whole thing of sharing makeup routine on Twitter and people worried that it's making it too pop, um, too, while it's also making it very accessible to a lot of people. Um, uh, and then, so New York Magazine, which is not any sort of radical hotbed of anything, it's a style culture magazine, really, had a cover story um, which said socialism, it's something like socialism, it's so popular now, right? And the sort of cover that if, you're, if you've been waiting this long to hear socialism in some popular discourse, is not the cover that'll make you happy because it'll be exactly that worry that, oh no, now it's just going to be a fashion. And that worry has been expressed. Um, then there's uh, a friend just introduced me to this about two months ago and after listening to it for a month, I said, oh, I can't listen to this, which is this podcast called Red Scare which they also call themselves socialists, but they're defiantly irreverent, very unpolitically correct. Um, and then part of you is like, oh, they're taking, they're taking stabs at the older generation, good. And then you're also worried about where this will lead. Uh, but I'm also feeling like my worry is an older person's, like I feel like I'm some, I, I definitely feel out of step to not enjoy Red Scare enough, right? Because all of it is part of the popularization. The other example, sorry, these are all American examples, because that's what I know the best, and maybe that's the, zenith of a certain kind of popularization of difficult politics also is Jacobin magazine, uh, which, you know, incredible success story, huge subscription, actually making money running a magazine that calls itself socialist. And the articles are very short. They're very glib. They're very much about like a quick, so this always ends with a upraised fist. And um, if you're dying for the sort of heavy duty analysis, it, you won't get that. At the same time, the things I read to get heavy duty analysis aren't read by very many people, right? So I, I mean, I don't know, I'm not resolved about, about it at all. Sometimes I feel like, oh, the nuance and analysis I'm seeking, am I also seeking the feeling it was when it was a few small people, you know, you're sort of some sort of, you're some sort of inner circle that understands and the moment it gets popular, not in the way we understand mass uprising popular, but popular through actually a magazine makes money. Uh, Netflix makes money. A documentary is actually popular. Um, AOC unabashedly wants to reach a lot of people, right? Um, it makes us very uneasy, right? So the US presidential elections is not something to talk about necessarily, but within that there's this discomfort that the more genuine earnest socialism of Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren might lose out to more populist strands. And then I hear some people say, well, you know, okay, this, the longing for the total revolution. But meanwhile, um, the right wing has in various countries certainly shown that even when they are in power for a couple of years, they're able to make massive incremental change, which is very hard to undo. So if these popular forms end up doing incremental change on the other side, I'm okay with that. It's definitely not anything of the energy that was talked about in the 70s, right, which was about overthrowing systems. You know, I don't think Alexander, I don't think Ocasio-Cortez thinks about overthrowing systems. She's working within the system. And then if she's working within the system, I suppose being on Twitter, uh, sharing what's considered popular to reach a larger audience, cooperating with a Netflix documentary fits within that. Um, you know, I think, uh, the hesitation I feel about that, maybe that you feel about it, is because neither of us are in a space where we need to get votes, right? So even our small audience um, is enough, right? Within the visual arts, even a small audience is enough to have, uh, uh, you know, a rich discursive thing. In fact, you might feel that if you're in a situation where 20 people watched a film or had a conversation or picked up a thing, that's somebody who really, really understood, right? But people who are trying to do popular politics can't do really, really understood of 20 people. So that's also the, that's also the difficulty of having somebody like myself or yourself or anybody here commenting on or thinking about mass popular politics because we are not punished or rewarded in the same way either, right? I mean, if this film or any of these films were also my way to try to get votes in a country, I would, you know, I mean, I, I know that's a, that's not really the point. And it's also, you know, it's like we're talking about two different things and trying to put them together. Um, I shared the discomfort about excess simplification and socialism becoming trendy in America is actually, of course, it makes everybody nervous. On the other hand, if the alternative is to have, you know, four more years of uh, neoliberalism or a super right-wing project, I'd rather take this incremental thing. And I think going back to the question about, you know, how 
you know what the films try to do or what the conversations i'm having try to do is something very different from what i would do i think when i'm actually trying to vote or get involved in something in those places i think um not that i would not that anyone should leave nuance but that those things have to operate in a different register maybe this space whatever this space is is supposed to be place where your ideal scenario is being worked out but meanwhile on election day or in terms of deciding what to donate or what to be involved in uh there are pragmatic things um i don't know if occupy wall street is a good example but occupy wall street is an example of a movement that i was involved in knowingly living in new york at the time seeing all the problems and of course the problems in the end killed it but for those brief couple of months it was like okay this is actually happening let me be involved it's it's not a good example because it wasn't it wasn't slick in the way of jacobin magazine i'm talking about but certainly in that moment i suspended all this nuanced analysis and just stayed with the crowd um and it didn't work out but if it worked out then i would say okay that wasn't the ideal thing but something happened through it um although it's really it's not good to compare occupy wall street because they were very definitely anti power and their refusal to make compromises you know they were asked what are your demands and they said the movement is the demands which is a beautiful thought but at the end of the day because there were no specific aid demands none of those demands got implemented although maybe it did in other ways in popular culture you know maybe ocasio cortez wouldn't have come out except something like occupy laying the groundwork um but also this is you can talk about it for hours and in an hour you will say some i'll say something different it's it's it this is very unresolved um and maybe going back to that question commenting on current politics with this is also a hazard because none of these movements i look at will reappear in this way um if it, something new will come for which there's no precedent there's a very patient audience <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you mom